the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Ab, episode 755 for Monday, April 1st, 2019. Good readings, folks, and Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all your questions, all your tips, all your cool stuff found. We sort through it. We pick the best. We pick the ones that are going to fit. And then we put them all together into an agenda. And then we answer your questions. We answer your tips. We answer your cool stuff found. It's like car talk for Apple users, if that makes sense. And really, the goal is that each and every one of us learns at least how many you right. That's right. Five new things every single time we get together. No fooling. That's right. Five new things. Sponsors for this episode include PDF pen at smilesoftware.com slash podcast keeps at keeps.com slash MGG Eero at Eero.com slash MD MGG. Check out coupon code MGG too. And LinkedIn.com slash MGG. We'll talk about all those in a moment here. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, springy, warm, 60 degree Durham, New Hampshire, at least while we're recording this. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in equally almost springy, though it's only in the 50s, though I think it will move to the 60s soon. Um, here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How goes it today, Mr. John F. Braun? That was a rough week, man. <laughs> it was. Especially if you use email. It's true. It's true. I want to talk about that. I, I just want to let everybody know I uh, I have a spring speaking fling going on here. Uh, let's see. I have three speaking events coming up in the next, uh, let's say, 15 days. So on Wednesday of this week, when the show comes out, Wednesday, April 3rd, I'm speaking uh, about Wi-Fi at Mac Tech Pro in Boston. That is a, a for pay event, but we have a deal for you because I told you we would have deals for you. You get 20 bucks off the lowest price that they would offer. So you can you can get any Mac Tech Pro, not just this week's Boston event, but any Mac Tech Pro event with our special link that uh, that'll be on MacGeekGab.com in the show notes uh, for just two seventy nine. So that's uh, that'll be fun. And then uh, two freebies. Uh Tuesday, a week from Tuesday, so Tuesday the 9th, I'm speaking at uh, in Princeton, New Jersey at PMUG for their Apple user group, uh, at, and that's in the evening. And then on Saturday, the 13th of April, I will be speaking, Skyping in, but uh, but speaking at the Suburban Chicago Mac users group uh, 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 and talking about uh, mesh Wi-Fi there. I'm actually not sure what I'm talking about in Princeton yet. I think I'm going to do backups, though. I think that's going to be a good one. So, so there you go. My spring speaking fling. If uh, if there's, you know, there you go. So, but yes, John, you uh, you you certainly hit the nail on the head. It was interesting, right? Because as listeners, at least of the last few weeks. No, we were planning on talking about email workflows today. And then on Monday, uh, Apple released 10 uh, Mac OS Mojave 10.14.4. And everything on Monday was pretty hunky dory for all of us. And then on Tuesday, things went sideways. If you were using a Google suite, like a, a custom domain email account with Gmail. And for some people, some Gmail accounts, but I think mostly this impacted uh, Google suite accounts, but not all of them. And the issue was that uh, Mac OS Mojave 10.14.4 with mail uses a different authentication method for these. It, it does not just log in with uh, with username and password like it used to. It does a whole Google OAuth thing, or at least it, it didn't used to do this for me. Maybe it did it for some of you, but um, where, you know, you're brought to a Web page, you sign into your Google account and then it passes a token back to mail and mail says, cool, I can log in and now get your email again, except that token never got passed back. And so mail kept saying, I can't log in. And sure enough, you couldn't get email if you had to use the Web. And so things sort of blew up. 
uh, people talked. We all kind of came up with some solutions. One of them that uh, that worked for me was creating a new email account and using just IMAP. So essentially doing it the old way where you you are logging mm-hmm. in with username and password. Right. And then someone else on Thursday or Friday came up with a, a solution that um, that got really interesting because it used a piece of software called Charles and Charles is a proxy. It, a, the, the, the best way I can explain it is it's you when you install it and run it on your Mac um, and give it permission. So it's not doing any of this stuff uh, without, you know, without your permission, but it sits in the middle of your connections, including encrypted connections, because you give it a certificate and you approve this certificate. And it's sort of a fake certificate, but it allows uh, you to see the contents of these and even manipulate and alter the results that come back from these. And so someone uh, very uh, savvy took Charles and watched what was happening with this Google connection, saw that there was a, a piece of information. I think it was the email address itself wasn't coming back. And they used, they, they came up with a, a simple little script to put into Charles to insert that back into the response. And then everything worked. So it essentially spoofed this by creating what I'll call an intentional man in the middle attack, right? Uh, a helpful man in the middle attack. And then, uh, and so folks started using that and that worked great. And then late on Friday night or early Saturday morning, depending on how you, uh, how you keep time, the problem just went away. And uh, I did some research into this and found that on Tuesday, the G Suite team had published uh, an announcement saying they were making some changes to the way their two factor authentication worked. But timing wise, that sure seems awfully coincidental And then the fact that everyone just like it all started working magically Friday night. This tells me that this was this was a a Gmail bug. Um, uh, Yeah, bug, maybe. Yeah, I guess that's the right word. Google suite bug. It did creep up early, early in the betas of 10.14.4 back in January, but Mm. then got then got fixed. Mm. So everyone was sort of surprised to see this, um, you know, see this appear back again. But I I think it was a perfect storm of timing. And and so if you have not yet upgraded to 10.14.4, it is safe now from. from, Well, I was going to say it's safe from an email standpoint. That's certainly true. But I think it's it's safe anyway. And and there's some good reasons to update to 10.14.4. In addition to supporting News Plus, um, it adds dark mode support to Safari, like automatic dark mode support to Safari. If a website like MacObserver.com, which was ready on release day, uh, has an alternate color scheme for people that are running dark mode, Safari will now uh, employ that color scheme. So if you're visiting the web in dark mode, you don't just get these, you know, well, you'll still get some like bright white background pages. But uh, for sites that that comply, you won't. And it's kind of nice. So that so that's there. Um, it adds support for the new AirPods, so that's kind of important. Um, it supports uh, various other things, but you know, includes the qual- it improves the quality of audio recordings and messages. And there was a um, the USB audio issue that was happening with the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, and the Mac Mini models that were introduced, you know, in 2018. That USB audio problem is now uh, fixed in there. So, so there's a lot yeah. of good things that, that there you was would also want. some email tweaks. And that's why initially I was shaking my fist at Apple because they mentioned, I think it, they had something like, I forget what it was. It was, a it was an AOL the, password it, issue. Excess, yes. Fixed. Excessive requests for a, for a password when it's like, well, you already have it. Why do you need it again? Right. So initially I was ready to shake my fist at Apple that they screwed something up because now, fortunately, Dave. And maybe they did. I mean, it's possible that, that this Google yeah. thing was coincidental. We have no, no, ba- you know, behind the scenes confirmation on this. Although, again, you know, I'm pretty confident based on the evidence and the timeline that it is what we just explained. But yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing. Now, here's why 
Yeah, I think you were talking about backups. Here's the nice thing about making a backup because the, the initially, you know, I couldn't access. So, you know, both my TMO and Mac Geek App emails are through Gmail. Right. I couldn't access them on my updated system. But I had a 10.14.3 backup that I mm. do every week. And so I was able to boot into that and everything was working great because, as you pointed out, the uh, authentic they use a different authentication method in the prior OS. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yep. So that's how I got around it. But then I also did the, you know, I created a generic IMAP account and that, that also worked uh, for yeah, the most the, part. The only problem with doing the additional account, uh, it certainly worked as a workaround and I did it too, but it's a completely new account as far as your Mac is concerned. If you sync your passwords with uh, iCloud Keychain, it will then sync that account to all your other Macs. It won't turn it on, uh, but it will be there. Mm. You can't delete the uh, old account from Well, you could delete the old account from from mail, but better to disable it because, again, with iCloud Keychain, that change propagates to all of your Macs and sometimes iOS devices. That's one of those things where it's like, yes, sometimes, but not always. Uh, so and and then, you know, you're duplicating data, right? If you've got a if you've got, you know, gigabytes of email on the on an IMAP server, then when you add this new account, you have all the email that was already there on your Mac, and then it's going to download a fresh copy of everything. The good news is that once, you know, once I got through all this and realized, oh, it's working the old way, great. And I deleted the new one. I watched it in the home library mail folder. I watched it delete all the old stuff or all the, you know, all the temporary stuff that I had added. So Mail does tend to keep that folder cleaned up, although I found some old things in there on one of my machines. So that's another one of those folders, home library mail to go in and, and uh, you know, check out. So anyway, the weird thing is that I didn't I didn't get a notification in software update about the update. The reason I actually learned about the update, Dave, is that um, when I tried to download server, so new version of server came out. It was like, uh, you're, you're not on the latest OS. So, um, you, yeah, you, you can't do it. Yeah. What are you doing? And I'm like, huh? Okay. So I manually downloaded the update and th that was, th that was kind of weird to me is that on neither of my machines, did it show up in software update the 10.14.4? It doesn't show up there right away. Um, I I've certainly seen that. And I, I don't know if that's like intentional, like, which it could be. Right. It, that Apple wants to roll it out, you know, slowly for people, because if mm -hmm. you have automatic updates turned on, it's just going to go ahead and do it like overnight for you. So w with the possibility of bugs like this, it, you know, it, it makes sense to do sort of a staged rollout. But but yeah, I didn't I didn't see it on mine until I launched um, system preferences software update. And and then it went mm -hmm. and looked and found it. And it was like, OK, yeah, you can have this now. So. Yeah, but I didn't get the notification either. I had to just go into software update and give it a minute and let it do that process where it, it you know, goes and looks. So well, let's see what happens. So my mini, I downloaded. Uh, I haven't updated my mini yet. I updated okay. my Mac Pro. Yep. Let's see, it is checking for updates. And give it a minute uh, and then usually it's it'll show up. It's taken a there. while. Yep. 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 Because it's got to go through all the receipts and nope. sort through nope. it. It says, oh, no. Oh, that's weird. Yes. Okay. So there at first go. it said your machine is up to date and then the screen updated and it says, oh, by the way, there's 10.14.4. Right. For you. Yep. Yep. All right. Craziness. Okay. Craziness. Craziness. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And then there's a little checkbox here automatically, which, yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. Right. I have it on I'm, my. I'm wary of automatic software updates. Uh, same. On any of my devices. I, I like to see what you guys are doing before i update same yeah yeah i'm i'm with you on that all right uh let's see so but we we as promised you know we have uh, been collecting and sifting through all of your uh email workflows that you've sent in so i want to um i want to go ahead and and talk through all of those actually uh, because i think there's a there's a great little story to tell here 
But, uh, John, if I may, first, I would love to uh, tell everybody about our first two sponsors for today. Fantastic. All right. We'd like to thank PDF Pen from Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast for sponsoring today's episode. PDF Pen, well, I mean, it's the ultimate tool for editing PDFs on your Mac, your iPhone, and your iPad. With PDF Pen, you can add headers and footers to your documents. You can actually edit graphics with their precision edit tool. You can use their library to store commonly used graphics, like not just commonly used graphics, but even pieces of text. I use uh, PDF pen to sign a lot of documents, both at my Mac. And as I said, on the go, so I have my signature, but not only my signature, I have like my name and my title and, various company names that we have, you know, from Backbeat Media LLC and the Mac Observer Inc. and things like that. So I can just drag them in. I don't have to type. And that's the idea. You get it right. It makes it easy. You can scan an OCR document so you can totally go paperless. And then with PDF Pen Pro, you can batch convert documents with OCR. You can convert entire websites into PDFs way better than the built-in functionality in Mac OS. Trust me on this. You can create your own fillable PDF forms and you can even edit table of contents. It's amazing. I, like I, I, I use PDF pen all the time. I know it sounds crazy that I'd be this excited about an app that edits PDFs, but PDFs are such a huge part of our online lives that it makes sense, right? They've replaced paper in so many ways. You need to have a tool that's really going to do this for you and help you to maximize what you're doing with PDF. So go check it out. Go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast. That's where you can download it and get everything all set. You can find your links to the app store stuff to download everything that you need. Our thanks to smile and PDF pen for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is LinkedIn jobs. You know, when it's time to make a hire for your small business, trust me, I know this, you want to find, you need to find the best person for the job. In fact, the wrong person can actually crater your business, right? Because each person is a huge percentage of your business. And think about this. You really want to make sure you get the right person. Well, LinkedIn jobs has a leg up over every other job person search engine out there. And the difference is LinkedIn jobs has people there every day that aren't actively necessarily looking for a job, but they are open to new opportunities. And oftentimes the best person to hire is someone that already has a job. You want to get somebody that's productive where they are. Their employer is happy with them, right? <laughs> you know, LinkedIn has that unfair competitive advantage because people are there posting interacting, all of that stuff, and you can find them and they're open to new opportunities. They match you with quality candidates that make the most sense. LinkedIn jobs also uses both hard skills and what they call soft skills to match you with the people that fit your role best, not necessarily the people that have a job with the title of the job that they would have at your company, but the people that fit the criteria that you're looking for based on skills, background, but also like interests, activities, passions, right? So that way you get the most relevant, qualified candidates for your role. Here's a deal that we have for you. Post a job today at linkedin.com slash MGG and get $50 off your first job post. Yep, that's right. You get $50 off your first job post at linkedin.com slash MGG. Terms and conditions apply. Our thanks to LinkedIn Jobs for sponsoring this episode. It's time for a deep, deep, deep dive. <laughs> yeah, so it is. It's time for a deep dive into mail. That's because that's what we promised we were going to do. First, I want to start and go through all of uh, or a few of the responses that just talk about sort of different workflows and different apps that, that people are using or different extensions that people are using and how that all works. And then, uh, well, you know, then we've got some other stuff to share. So first, uh, we'll go with Ron. Ron says, I use mail exclusively personally 
though I have Outlook at uh, at my work. I do not keep all my emails, but what I keep, I store in iCloud mailboxes. He says, I use Mail Act On to help me organize my mailboxes. And I use SaneBox to make Sane Later and Sane News. He says, I have used Mail Steward for archiving, but I found the interface arcane and I rarely accessed it. So I stopped. He says, I have iCloud mailboxes for many things, but very important numbers and serial numbers, etc., are emailed then to Evernote as a second backup. So the things I want to focus on here are, are two things that are near and dear to my heart and probably uh, not uncommon to anyone listening. And that's mail act on and sane box. So mail act on is uh, a way to invoke rules with keystrokes. That's really the best way I can. It does more than that, but, but that's its main function in life. So Let's say you want to you have several different archive mailboxes like Ron talks about here with his iCloud things. He can create a rule that says, take the highlighted message and send it to, you know, uh, uh, receipts archive. And, and another one that says, take the highlighted message and send it to my, uh, you know, medical archive or whatever. Right. Or my car archive, whatever, whatever it's going to be. And then Mail Act On lets you assign those rules to keystrokes so you can very quickly archive your mail or do things with your mail uh, just by invoking something with the keyboard. You know, quick little like, you know, control M for medical and boom, it's it archives it, it puts it there. You can have because it's rules, you can have it marked as read or unread or flagged or not flagged or anything like that. So so that's Mail Act On. I also use Mail Act On to. Uh, to do that, but also to delay my sends. So I, every email I send is on a two minute delay. Let me tell you how much that saves time and, and not time. Obviously it adds time, but saves my bacon often. Cause I'll hit send and it'll be like, Oh, I wanted to, or, Oh, I shouldn't have, or any of those things that two minute buffer, man. So nice. Sane box watches your email as it comes in. Really. It watches your email all the time. And it, filters things. So he talked about sane later and sane news. These are automatic mailboxes that SaneBox creates on your IMAP server and it works with Gmail. It's worked this week with Gmail too. So whatever happened there didn't mess with SaneBox because they didn't change their authentication path. Uh SaneBox automatically notices things that are like newsletters and mailing lists and stuff and will put them in sane news. Uh, it also finds things that are maybe things you're, you know, CC'd on or other not super important things and moves those to sane later. So you can go through this stuff. But the good part is if you're going through sane later or sane news and you say, ooh, I want one of those, I, that message, I always want these to come to my inbox. You just move it to your inbox. It notices you did that and it retrains itself for that specific message for you. So it starts with a with some group heuristics. But immediately you can train it to to be very personalized to you. And and man, Sanebox is awesome. So uh, I could, it's one of those couldn't live without things for me. So any thoughts on that before I uh, share Lauren's thing here, John? Well, I'll toss in one yeah. program that I use to also solve this uh, email thing. And that's Spark. It's like, huh. Okay. Never really used it before. I have it on one of my machines. I never really used it that much. But once this issue, uh, Google issue came up, I'm like, huh, let me give it a try. Um, and that was another way I tried to solve the problem was to use a different email client. Sure. Because uh, it didn't have any issue with logging in for whatever reason. Right. Um, it's still... Uh, it wasn't totally smooth, though, because, you know, for example, we have aliases. Uh, you know, my login is is not the address that I use for one of our accounts and the signatures and stuff. You know, it wasn't the, the, those didn't come over and stuff like that. So um, but at least I was able to see the emails. I was able to ret retrieve them. Sure. Um, but I'd. Uh, I'd say, hey, you know, look at other email clients. And then that's a way a lot of other people saw the email issue was was doing that. Spark is the one that that I have uh, installed on one of my machines. So, cool. Um, yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes and good this sense. This whole issue may have encouraged people to explore alternate email clients. 
seems like it did. Although it wasn't, although it wasn't Apple's fault. <laughs> Probably not Apple's fault. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think it was. I'll put an asterisk on that. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, OK, so moving on to Lauren, who has sort of a different strategy. Um, he says, uh, greetings, geeks. My dearly departed wife used to fastidiously work to keep her inbox empty. This seems a little bit retentive to me, he says my gate swings the other way. Gmail taught me that I don't need to delete anything. I learned the benefits of Google remembers everything and searching to find what I need. He says, I now have more than half a dozen email addresses and they are all handled through Apple mail. Keeping this wild collection in my inbox makes it very easy to find out if I ever received that email or to search for something in the past. So this is sort of the exact opposite of what Ron was just talking about with filtering and, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, he says, I have fit searching my previous orders on Amazon specifically because they have them categorized by year. I don't remember what year I ordered it. I just want to see it. The only problem I ever have is that mail can be sluggish presenting an email message after I select it. I assume at least part of the problem uh, is the spinning hard drive in my mid 2012 MacBook Pro. Coincidentally, I have also been notified of deteriorating battery. But uh, but there you go. So, yeah, Lauren's inbox forever uh, thing. He uh, pointed out that uh, he's got one hundred seventy eight thousand messages in his inbox. And uh, yeah, but there you go like that. He's he's not wrong that, you know, I used to be crazy anal when we used eudora back in the day john i had filed i had like a, a you know a, an archive for you an archive for my wife an archive for almost every person certainly every client that i dealt with all of that stuff because i needed to be able to find those emails and if i didn't pre-sort them the the search functionality was very very limited and wouldn't really you know find me what i needed and certainly not quickly Obviously, that's now changed. We've gotten much better with sorting, sorting and searching. So uh, so this one, the concept of one, I, I was going to say one archive, but but with Lauren, it's less than that. It's one email box like that's it. The email is all right there. So it's an interesting concept. Thoughts, John? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's one way to do it. <laughs> it is. Yep. All right. Dan uh, says. Uh, I'll describe my process, but I don't like it. So I'm eager to hear from other people. He says, I have three basic accounts that I manage, two personal and one uh, for a, a nonprofit that he works with. He says, I have folders set up for various activities within each account. My combined inbox usually contains many emails as I want quick access or as a reminder for me to do something. When the inbox gets too big, I will move email from the inbox for that account to a folder called Action Needed iCloud or Action Needed Gmail. All this does is basically empty the inbox. Those those folders are still high on my priority list. I then use Mail Steward to archive emails for the past four years. I have a different archive for each year. I archive them to my local SSD. I then use Carbon Copy Cloner to copy that archive to my Drobo as a backup. At the end of the year, I create a new Mail Steward archive. I then delete a lot of emails, especially in my sent folder for that year. Uh, I, li I do this knowing that I can find them in a Mail Steward if I need to. I've also turned off the thread feature in mail because I found that some emails with the same subject, but unrelated content would sometimes get put into a thread where it didn't belong. This caused confusion, which is why I have disabled it. I've been struggling with email management for a long time. I want the ability to find emails quickly without using up lots of gigabytes on my local SSD. So that's interesting, right? Cause that's a, that's a concern with email is it can take up a lot of space on your local drive. And, and so using something like mail steward or perhaps some of the other methods that we're going to get into shortly here, uh, it, it, you know, can alleviate that, um, and, and off offload mail because you can't really point mail at, you know, two different places. Like you can say with photos or, or, or whatever. So I kind of, I, I like Dan's process, but I can see where it can be a little cumbersome. So maybe something else we'll talk about here. will spark no pun intended a, uh, a change for Dan. So thoughts on any of that, Mr. Mr. Braun, before we share, uh, share Mike here. Not at the moment. Okay. All right. So Mike says, uh, I use Apple mail and, uh, he says on my, on my Mac, I have a few rules to set flags to email, uh, flag 
anything red that's related to billing or finance stuff. I use the yellow flag to uh, highlight anything for my daughter's school or activities. And uh, I flag orange, anything that I need to keep track of for easy reference, usually for about a month. And then I flag gray any emails related to upcoming vacations or travel. Uh, this is I have mail app on the Mac set up with several smart mailboxes, one for each of the flagged emails. So this is an interesting thing, right? You can use smart mailboxes to find and, and collate together emails that might not be in the same box just because they have the same flag. And he says, as I pay bills I or deal with my daughter's school or swim stuff or whatever, he says, I just unflag the email and boom, it's gone from the smart mailbox. So this is an interesting I've started using flags just in the last couple of months in a similar way. And this can be a handy thing since this works pretty well, except that mail sometimes gets confused and shows an email in the smart mailbox, even though it's no longer flagged. This can sometimes be challenging to straighten out, but mail seems to be getting better in this regard and usually fixes itself. I've seen that too. smart mailboxes in general don't necessarily update in real time, but it's hard to hard to say what what it's doing. Uh, he says, as I receive my email on my phone, I may flag it here, but here i wish that i could select which flag ios only has flag or not flagged you can't set colors of flag so it doesn't match um he says it it works he says these fall into my red group which is a good thing is this is the one group that gets most of my attention and i can then just recategorize when i'm sitting on my mac and then once per year he says usually at the end of january i'll create or update some of the smart mailboxes that filter all my unflagged email um, prior to January 1st of the new year, I'll export these to a new on my Mac mailbox with an encrypted sparse bundle. I'll verify that all the old received sent email was archived and then delete those to keep my active email boxes clean. So this is interesting. He exports it to a mail compatible mailbox and saves it into a sparse bundle. But then that could that sparse bundle could be saved on an external drive or, you know, if you have a network storage drive or something so that's another way to kind of prune down your local mail uh, library, which is interesting. So what do you think, Mr. Mr. John? Uh, yeah, I use flags. Okay. Quite a bit. I'm looking here and I actually have, um, so of course, an Apple mail um, in mailboxes, there, there will be one called flagged. And right now I see I have sure. 118 things flagged for various reasons and I use different colors and I'm not sure if my strategy, if the colors make sense right now, but I flag things. Uh, the reason being uh, rather than searching, you know, far and wide. Sure. That, that email, it's just, you know, it's like, ah, this is something, you know, I should pay attention to and uh, you know, not, not lose track of. Right. The interesting thing is that on iOS, I just looked at my phone here is that flagged is not turned on by default as far as I can tell, or at least not on my iPhone. So if you go to mail on iOS, um, here's a you know quick tip here. Uh, you're going to see your mailboxes and, you know, I see all inboxes, Mac Ecab, so on and so forth. But there's an edit button in the upper, or an edit selection in the upper right-hand corner. If you click on that, you're then going to see some additional uh, categories that you can use and oh yeah well, there's a lot of stuff here uh, um, but one of them yeah. is flagged so so by default on ios as far as i can tell that is not enabled so right if, if you want more options on ios hit, hit that edit button when you're looking at mailboxes um yeah some of this looks useful it that, Today, that I, i'm glad you brought that up man attachments flagged unread two or c uh, Okay. Yeah, huh. that's a handy little thing, man. I like that. I had forgotten all about sort of customizing the way and the order in which things appear. Because when you hit that edit button, um, well, there it is. Okay. Yeah, when you hit that edit button, as John said, you can, you know, check or uncheck the boxes that you want. But then you also, on the right side of that list, you can drag up and down to change the order in which they appear for you in mail. So if you've got stuff that you want to float to the top, well, float it to the top. That's pretty good, man. I'm, thanks for bringing that up. That's great. 
Uh, Thomas, this is one of the, I, I love these moments. It's like, it, it, like we had the John F. Braun moment from John F. Braun. Thomas has like what I call the John F. Braun moment where you like you, you, my friend have this knack for looking at things from a completely different perspective than, than I ever would. And <laughs> no, and I, and like, like with this, like I totally forgot about that thing in me and in, in iOS mail. Like it, it happens all the time. It's great. Thomas has one of these things. I, I think. He says, uh, my archive strategy maybe is a little special, but it works for me. He says, first, I don't sort my mails anymore. I did this in the old days of Eudora. We all did. He says, which I used until about 2005. Now I just read them and mark them in one of my colors. uh, If I have to do or don't forget them. Uh, After a year, mostly in February, March. It seems like February, March is the uh, time to archive the prior years, the prior calendar years email. I delete all irrelevant mails like newsletters. I then create a new folder for each in and out box and move all the messages to this folder and close mail. Now I go to my library, my home folder, library folder, mail. And then you go into in Mojave V6 and High Sierra V5. But you go to home, library, mail, V6. And then you got to go into the folder for your mailbox. And you might just have to check some of these arcanely named folders to find the uh, the one for that particular, you know, on my Mac uh, archive it says I then copy the newly created mailbox, which is just a folder here to another folder outside of the library. Then I open mail and I delete that mailbox. Mail is now much thinner. It does not contain the messages anymore. But if I search for a message, all I have to do is go to this archive folder and search it in the finder. And it'll show me the message. And if I want to, I just double click the message and it shows it to me in mail so I can reply or forward it to someone or something. But it's not living inside his mail archive. This is the brilliant part, right? So he's created a mail mailbox. It is totally compatible with mail, right? There's no worries about the developer, you know, going out of business or anything like that. I mean, I guess there is a worry about Apple going out of business, but, you know, slightly less so with them than than some, you know, indie developer that, um, you know, might or might not uh, be in business in a year. And who knows? And it's just in the finder. They're all individual files because years ago, uh, Apple moved mail from being in the 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 all like every mailbox with as one file, it moved it into this folder with with messages as as files format because that makes spotlight work better inside mail, but it also makes spotlight work better outside mail. So these are just individual files. You can see them. They're text files. And, you know, you'd be able to read them on pretty much any Mac. It's brilliant. I really like this idea. Um, and I, as I've been thinking about it all week, I I can't really poke any holes in the uh, in the, you know, the, uh, what's, what am I, what's the right word? Easy for me to say just the, the, the reliability of this. So I, I'm excited about this one. So thank you, Thomas. It's, that's a, an interesting little, uh, little thing. What do you think about that, John? Hmm. Yeah. I don't really, Hmm. You I don't archive my, uh, yeah, not really. It's, it's, it's all there. I mean, I got some, folders or mailboxes that uh have that's my strategy same i just yeah. store it all in all in mail I mean, sometimes, I mean sometimes i'll i mean sometimes i'll archive i will use the archive feature no no i'll take that back i will use the archive feature at least for like for some of our some of the stuff yep like mac ecab i'll uh, sure you know i tr- i try to um I mean, how do you archive? You may ask. I think you just, yeah, you just right click on it and there's an archive choice and it puts it somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, I mean, every now and then I'll clear out like, you know, Mac Gab, I'll archive. I'll, I'll, I'll keep usually like a year, year's worth of stuff in, in the primary box. And then I'll, you know, purge that just because at least in my imagination, it makes it, it makes it more responsive. Okay. Yeah. And it might, I, you might be right about that. Yeah. I, yeah. I wonder if using mails archive function would create something identical to what Thomas is describing. Like, is he, I mean, what he's doing isn't, isn't bad, but you know, it, it takes the extra step of copy the folder, then go back in, then delete the folder from mail. Like I, I wonder 
Uh, I'll have to, I'll have to play with this. This is, this is interesting. Speaking of archives, uh, Robert shares that, uh, he says, I solved my mail archive problem and my desire to have a copy of all my mail stored locally in a format that is universal. Okay. Right. So same thing we're talking about here with your archive solution or Thomas's John, uh, he says by using the utility mail archiver X or mail archiver 10 at mothsoftware.com. Although it does have the ability to collect all your email from multiple accounts into its own internal SQL database, it can simply directly archive all the email to a folder structure with each email rendered in PDF format and the email attachments collected in that folder. It works like a charm and the PDFs are easily searchable and viewable with whatever your favorite tools are. Previously, he says I was using Email Archiver Pro to do a similar thing, but I found the software to be buggy and unreliable, and it hasn't been updated in a long time. I'm glad I found Mail Archiver X. It's a much better solution. I like this. This is that that's fascinating to me. The whole PDF thing that that because that's going to I can't imagine a world where PDFs are not going to be readable. So I like it. That's pretty good, Robert. Pretty good. Um, Ian has uh, has kind of a, a different way of doing this altogether. All he says, I use Postbox as my email client and Mail Backup X as my mail backup program. It backs up everything to my QNAP raid in pretty much real time with attachments. Folder structure is retained. It has allowed me to keep the amount of email I retain in Postbox to a minimum. And for me, it's absolutely ideal. So thank you for that. That's great. Yeah. Postbox is another, you know, third party um, email client that uh, that a lot of people seem to like. Yeah. I'm I, you know, I uh, obviously started, you know, life with a, a third party email client because I was using Eudora. Then I think from Eudora, I went maybe Apple mail was a thing at that point. I can't remember. And then for a while, I was with MailSmith, which was an email client created. I think I might have gone right from Eudora to MailSmith. Uh, but uh, MailSmith was an email client created by Rich Siegel of Barebone Software. And I really liked it for a while. But again, you know, it, it became this thing where it was like, oh, I want different features than Rich wants. Then Rich made MailSmith essentially and primarily for himself. In fact, I think he still does. But um, it got to the point where where MailSmith wasn't um, wasn't able to handle my my size of my archives. And uh, although Rich fixed that, uh, it, it just it, it I, I needed to move and I moved to mail. And since then, I've been really happy because I know that my mail client is going to work with the next version of Mac OS. And that's always a nice thing. Now I do rely on a couple of plugins, specifically the, you know, small cube mail suite, which has mail act on in it uh, that we mentioned before. And that as we've seen, doesn't always get updated in time for new OS releases. So that, that, you know, maybe I, maybe I haven't quite solved my problem, but uh, I know I can get to my email in future versions of, of Mac OS. And that's, you know, important. Although this week, that wasn't entirely the case, but, uh, but yeah, there you go. Fixed. Uh, speaking of third party email clients, Andrew, uh, suggests one from, uh, from, uh, uh, Mozilla, right? The people that make Firefox and that is Thunderbird. Uh, he says, uh, that he, that that's what he uses and he, he likes Thunderbird. And I'm, I'll be honest, I have, uh, I have used Thunderbird. I use Thunderbird for, um, for a couple of things that I do here. And, uh, it, you know, if I have to archive like mail from an old staff member or whatever, Thunderbird makes it, does make it really easy to have different profiles and you can choose to store your mail wherever you want. And it's not a terrible client. It's not fantastic, but it's not terrible. So... Uh, as Andrew says, he says, uh, I'm a firm believer in Thunderbird. It's ugly. And the interface is a bit of an unholy mess, but it works and it works well. Important stuff. He says, I stick in local folders and he's right. It, you know, it's, it, it supports all the functionality of IMAP and mail doesn't quite do some of those things. So, uh, so if, you know, in, in terms of third party email clients, I tend to trust Thunderbird because it's multi-platform, 
and it uh, it's made by a company that that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So uh, so there you go. Thunderbird. Yeah, it's fast. It's just I like his description about the interface being an unholy mess. That, that's accurate. So <laughs> have you ever messed with Thunderbird, John? Uh, I dabbled with it for a while. Yeah. But um, no, one thing I was I, w- I was messing around with here. I, so I mentioned Spark, which mm-hmm. looks to be good for basic functionality. But the one thing that I don't see in there is support. Um, so if you're looking at another email client, um, one thing you may want to consider is how does it handle encryption and signing? And I don't because mm-hmm. when I was when I was listing my when I was looking at some of the stuff in my TMO box, I, I think I actually saw some, uh, uh, or MGG, I think it was the MGG box, but I saw some messages from you and it showed a, uh, what's it? Just an the, attachment, the, probably an S mime. Yeah, it showed, it showed a, a, yeah. an attachment. Uh, I can't, uh, and I'm trying to search for this and I can't seem to, f- I don't think it's able to do signing or encryption. Hmm. I could be wrong. I'll, hmm. I'll do some more research here but yeah it would just show a, a you know I, I forget the name of the file s mime something sure piece but all it showed was an attachment and no text so i'm like huh how, how do you yeah so if you're moving to a new email client um definitely look at how they handle signing and encryption it, it, it appears to me and i can could be wrong and let us know or i'll i'll ask them uh yeah cool <laughs> I mean, they should, I mean, it should be able to go into the keychain like mail and, you know, see your certificates and, and be aware of signing and encryption. But right. Maybe not. I don't know. Right. Right. Cool. Uh, a couple of, or a tip from listener Ben, who chimed in on, on some of this and talked about how he organizes mail's favorites bar. So you can, you, it, it, it auto populates when you start mail with some uh, your favorites bar being the thing sort of between the toolbar and your message viewer window that lists some mailboxes. And I think inbox is there and maybe sent is there. You can drag any mailbox you want to this and you can reorder the ones that are there. And if you want to take one off, just drag it uh, off the bar and it'll poof. Doesn't delete the mailbox. It just deletes it from being in the favorites bar, similar to Safari or anything like that. And similar to Safari, so here's a tip for those two apps if you've forgotten, because like me, because I forgot, uh, the command key combined with the numbers across the top of your keyboard map exactly to those things in the favorites bar. So if your inbox is the first thing in the favorites bar and you hit or in mail and hit command one, you will be brought to your inbox. And the same is true for you know the sixth thing on the list and the seventh i think i think you're finished at 10 things but uh but there you go so if you want to put some favorites up there i use favorites all the time i have our mac geek gab email boxes up there and all that stuff but um it's a it's a great way to sort of bounce back and forth again without having to leave the keyboard so thank you for that that tip ben that's that's just one of those things i had completely forgotten about so good stuff huh mr braun Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have some cool stuff found to go through and all of that, but uh, but that that wraps up our 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 mail segment for oh, this for this episode. No. What about John? We'll get to we we've got some questions about mail that that we'll, but we may get to later in the episode. I think or, I had a brilliant solution. To okay, Johnny's well then we'll though. we'll definitely get to Johnny's mail question <laughs> when we get to the. Well, I'll put that at the top of the questions list, and. Uh, and uh, and then, but we've got some cool stuff found and other things that we want to get to. But if you have things about mail that you want to send to us, of course, questions, tips, anything to add to this conversation, you know how things go. We do a deep dive and then it lingers for a while and perhaps forever because it's mail. It's something uh, I think all of us deal with at some level. So send them to us. Feedback at MacKeekab.com. I think I heard you right in that you said feedback at MacKeekab.com. I did. I said feedback at MacGeekab.com for sure. So, yeah. All right. But uh, so cool stuff found. And boy, I'm really excited to talk about a couple of these things and cool stuff found. But first, John, I'm really excited to tell everybody about our next two sponsors, if that's OK with you. OK. All right. I am super happy to have Eero 
not only as a sponsor, but I'm super happy to have Eero in our lives and of our, in our world. You know, we've talked a lot about mesh networks here on Mac Geek Gab and Eero really does sit at the very top of our recommendation list here. The single router model just doesn't work for the high bandwidth world. In addition, you know, often a single router doesn't get you the coverage that you need, right? What you need is a distributed system where you've got multiple access points, not only in key places around the house, but also to serve multiple devices simultaneously, right? And with Eero, that's what you get, right? Enterprise grade Wi-Fi system in your home. And here's the best part in just a few minutes, right? You don't need to be an enterprise grade network manager to get enterprise grade Wi-Fi. You do it all from an app, right? The Eero app lets you manage your network from, from your hand and from anywhere, right? You can do it in your home and also manage your network remotely. This is super handy if you manage networks for, say, your parents or your friends or your clients. You can do it all from where you want. Now, Eero has Eero Plus, which is the ability to block malicious and unwanted content across your entire network and the networks of your parents and your friends and your clients. It's got advanced security in it so that you can make sure you're not visiting sites that have known threats, right? All those malicious sites, they've got a database that they keep up to date. And anytime you go somewhere, they check against that database to make sure that you are not visiting somewhere that's going to cause you trouble, right? They've got content blocking so that you can choose uh, to, you know, filter out things like, you know, violent, illegal, or adult content, right? But you get to pick ad blocking. Again, you get to pick, right? Very, very cool stuff. So you got to check out Eero with Eero Plus because that's the way they just simply provide reliable security that defends your entire home against things like malware and spyware and phishing attacks and all that stuff. How much better can it get? Well, it can get better. Never think about Wi-Fi again and get a hundred bucks off the Eero base unit and two beacons package and one year of Eero plus. Yeah, I know hundred bucks off the Eero base unit and two beacons package. So you've got three devices that you put throughout your home. Plus you get a year subscription towards Eero plus, which we talked about. Visit Eero.com slash M G G that's E E R O.com slash M G G. That's how you get this package. hundred bucks off the Eero base unit and two beacons, one year of Eero plus hundred bucks off. I know it's crazy. Eero.com slash M G G. And at checkout, you enter promo code MGG. So that's important. Eero.com slash MGG, promo code MGG at checkout. Our thanks to Eero for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is Keeps at Keeps.com slash MGG. Look, we've talked about this before here. Losing your hair sucks, right? And two out of three guys will experience hair loss by the time they're just 35. Keeps is the easiest and most affordable way to keep the hair that you have. Keep System uses FDA-approved products that used to cost so much, but now, thanks to Keeps, they're finally inexpensive and simple and easy to get. For five minutes now, and starting at just 10 bucks a month, you'll never have to worry about hair loss again. And here's the cool part. Getting started with Keeps is easy. I said five minutes now. It really is less than five minutes. They've got a great web interface. You answer a couple questions, snap a couple photos of your hair. Then a licensed physician reviews all your information online and recommends the right treatment for you. So you've actually got a partner in this. Then it's shipped right to your door every three months. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved hair loss products out there. Some of you have probably tried them before, but you've never gotten them for this price. Keeps is only 10 to 35 bucks a month. Plus now you get your first month for free. That's one heck of a deal for getting to keep your hair. Get it? Keeps. Okay. To receive your first month of treatment for free, you got to go to our special URL, keeps.com slash MGG. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash MGG for a free month of treatment. Again, keeps.com slash MGG. Keeps. Hair today, hair tomorrow. Our thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, you know, I like AirPods. 
Uh, I've talked about that, but I also like the earphones, you know, that seal and all that stuff. But I really like the true wireless kind of thing where you just put something in your ears and, and you're good to go. So I constantly test these things and occasionally one rises, you know, above the quality level and and uh, for some reason rises to to the show. The Airmo B3, A-E-R-M-O-O-B3 matches this, hits the mark for me. They feel good in your ears. They sound really good. They've got a cool little case uh, that charges them, of course. But, uh, you know, it's got like a little like a little magnetic door on it and stuff. It, it doesn't it's it's similar to AirPods in that sense. I mean, it's slightly different form factor and stuff fits in your pocket really nicely. Like I said, it sounds good. You can use the there's the like the ear earpieces themselves have. Uh, kind of a button integrated into them so you can change the volume. Yes, you can skip tracks, all of that stuff. They're wa uh, waterproof, IPX7, Bluetooth 5, right? All of that good stuff. Here's my favorite part. As of this moment, at least in time, they are available on Amazon for $29.99. You got it. Yep. $29.99. I know. <laughs> It's freaking amazing. I, I was shocked when I tested them and it's like I couldn't find anything that I didn't like about them. It's crazy. Crazy, 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 crazy. Sounds like they could probably charge a little more. <laughs> I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, that's a, I mean, what, what, what do AirPods retail for these days? Uh, 169. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So 29.99. That's pretty good. Yep. I think 169 is that right? that's got to be right. I'm just pulling that off. Like it's that's what's in my head. It's either 169 or 179, but it's uh, it's in there. Well, hang on. I can I can find AirPods. Let's go. Apple. Apple's going to help me on this. I don't want to be I don't want to be wrong about this. Click buy 159. All right. So there you go. So 159. So so the the AirMo B3s are only one hundred thirty dollars cheaper than the AirPods. So there you go. <laughs> yeah crazy uh, really cool so i i i recommend these my wife uh quickly uh, stole them from me and and is using them happily so it's fine i have other things that i can use but uh these these fit her ears and they come with with like a couple of different tips and stuff they do seal in the ear and all that stuff but she has um she always ha seems to have difficulty finding like things that will fit comfortably for her. So when she found it was like, okay, yeah, you take these. It's fine. So yeah, um, while it's CES, John, I think you noticed the new, uh, bag that I had for both CES and for South by Southwest. Um, it's, uh, for years I had been using the, the freebie gimme bags that, uh, CES gave us, but a couple of years ago, they started turning those into clear bags and I'm not really into the clear bag thing. Most of the time, so uh, I started using a backpack from a company called Solo New York at solo-ny.com. I'm using one called the Unbound Backpack, and it's actually pretty cool. Um, the, your, it's got a laptop compartment. It's got it's just the right size. It's not bulky and too big, and it actually can expand quite a bit. But, you know, when it's sort of cinched up and all that, it's got plenty of room in there, but it's not this big, uh, unwieldy thing. It's really kind of comfortable and, and nice. And, uh, and it has the, uh, the, the, this feature where you put your laptop in the sort of the backmost pocket. If you're thinking of it that way, you can uh, unzip that entire pocket on three sides so it can fold open and you don't have to take your laptop out. If you're going through normal, you know, TSA screening, if you're going through pre-check, you don't have to take it out anyway. But, uh, if you're going through normal TSA, you just sort of unfold the whole thing open and they're able to scan your backpack because it doesn't have anything else uh, other than padding around your laptop. So pretty cool thing. It's uh, it's showing is uh, sold out on uh, on their website at the moment. I'll put a link to it, but uh, but uh, maybe uh, maybe Amazon or somebody has has still some of them still in stock. No, they don't. But uh, I'll put a link to it. It's uh, it's definitely worth checking out. So throw that one out there. Anything to add to either of these two things, the Airmo B3s or the Solo Unbound, John? Speaking of Amazon, have yes. you ever used Amazon Locker? 
I have not. I've I've I am aware of it. But for those people that aren't explain. Um, I just used it the other day. So um, I was ordering a, a gift for uh, for a family member and. Um, it's basically a secure delivery option if you want to uh, for things of a certain size. Um, and they have one at Whole Foods because, you know, Amazon uh, bought Whole Foods. Right. So they actually have one uh, a few minutes away from me. Um, and I decided, yeah, let me, let me check it out. And uh, it's it's pretty neat. So rather than shipping to your home, you can say, well, ship to the Amazon the, to my nearest Amazon locker. And then what happens is once you once it's put in the box, um, you get an email and it says, all right, um, uh, you know, either here's your code or they actually uh, email you a barcode. So it, it can scan the barcode or you can type it in manually. And it was funny because actually when I was there, there was a guy ahead of me and he actually punched it in manually like a, like a caveman, whereas I did the barcode. But it scans the barcode and then a door pops open and it's like, well, here, take your stuff. It's a, uh, and it uses, it, it, it was interesting. Uh, it uses, um, I think this one was actually delivered by UPS. Okay. I think UPS. Yep. Um, but it's just kind of a neat option. Um, That's cool. You know, yeah. especially if you're not, if you're not home to right. receive something. Right. Though, I mean, in my case and probably your case, I mean, you know, rarely do I get things that require a signature for, for me to be there, but it's a, but it's a interesting option. Yeah. I, yeah. 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 I've thought about using it like for, um, if I'm traveling somewhere, cause it's, it's actually seems to be more and more frequent that I'll have something shipped to my hotel from Amazon, usually consumables of some sort. Like I, I'll, I like to, you know, if I'm going to visit like an ad agency or something, I'll bring like some some, you know, treats or candies or something to them, you know, and it's like, oh, I'll just have them shipped to my hotel. That way I don't have to put them in my suitcase or whatever. And um, and so I've thought about using Amazon Locker to do that. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, all right. Ben has uh, he says uh, a client of mine has several hundred MP4 videos. Uh, captured by an old Android phone. They are in an arcane format with an AVCHD container that QuickTime player and photos can't natively read or import, but they are just H264 videos. So the, the video content should be fine. He says, it's just the container. I needed a way to convert them from uh, where they are to a much more standard MP4 format container. I should say uh, among the multitude of video converter converter apps, I found any MP4's Mac Video Converter Ultimate. I was able to select any or all of the videos, indicate a destination, and easily convert them into readable containers. He says I paid thirty three bucks for a one year license and only ran into one glitch. If you select the destination folder as the same folder as the source, the app offers to replace the original video with the converted one. For me, he says it failed to complete these conversions. And left me with two second clips instead. So point it somewhere else. But uh, thanks, Ben. I'm glad that's great. I'm glad that worked. Pretty cool. Graham, do oh, you have anything to add to that, John, before I, I nope. bring us to Graham CSF? All right. Uh, Graham uh, says, where's Graham here? Says, uh, for quite a few years, I have used Ecamm Network's phone view application for archiving my messages and voicemails back to that conversation uh, from iPhone to Mac he says note that it is especially uh, a continually growing archive, not a backup of a single point in time, but it doesn't remove any data from the phone. So we'll put a link to phone view. He says the primary purpose for me was to have an archive of my voice messages stored in the visual voicemail, which disappear when you change SIM cards. It made their $30 lifetime purchase price very, very, very much worthwhile. Uh, as you would hope, when it displays the archive, it matches the numbers to contact names. Of course it does, uh, which are not innately stored within the archive itself, but it cross-references them for you. So that's pretty cool. I hadn't thought about that, but uh, which is why we do this show, because we all get to learn. So thanks, Graham. Yeah, I've used PhoneView for other things, but... Never thought about it for the, uh, from that standpoint. So that's pretty good. Thoughts on that before we go to our last cool stuff found here, John? Continue. Okay. Lawyer Jeff uh, posted 
colorize.sg. It's spelled the uh, what I would call the British way. C-O-L-O-U-R-I-S-E dot S-G. And it does something that some of you may love and some of you may hate, pr- probably simultaneously, depending on wh- where you're applying it. It takes black and white photos and colorizes them. And it actually does a pretty good job of not making them look like, you know, pastels or something or or, you know, fluorescent colors sometimes like it's a it they look pretty tasteful, um, at least in the in the you know, the the things I've tried. So it's at colorized or yeah, colorized.sg and uh, you can just upload a photo and it does it right there on the website. So pretty cool stuff. Thanks, Jeff. Good stuff. Fun, fun. Yeah, it's good. It doesn't. Um, I've noticed. Uh, you probably know about HDR high. Of course. Uh, yeah. 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 Sometimes people get a bit carried away when they do HDR on some images, and that you look at it, and it's just like that's not real. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's good that they take that into account because yeah, I'm with you. Is that sometimes colorizing can uh, some people consider colorizing a, a, a photo crop. Yeah. Well, and it, I mean, sure. Yeah. But that's that's the thing, right? It's I mean, it's art. So, uh, you know, you do you. And if, if you like it, then there you go. You're good to go. Um, one note about uh, from the chat room at MacGeekUp.com slash stream. Brian Monroe there noted when we were talking about the Airmove B3s that he has both the version one and version two of the AirPods. So I wanted to share with you experientially what what he's finding with those. He says the best two things are the faster connection times and wireless charging. Um, He says, now I just wish uh, I had that the Apple TV remote had Qi charging uh, because that would actually be a handy thing. That's, that's a good point. Um, That would be a nice, another nice place to have wireless charging is in a, in a remote like that. That way you're not having to think about plug it in. Like we mostly use our Logitech harmony, one remote that has a charging base. So it, you know, it sits there, but yeah. 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 Oh huh. yeah. Uh, my remotes are all on uh rechargeable batteries. Well, everything's on rechargeable batteries. The question is what's it take to recharge it? Right. The, it, our, our harmony one remote probably would need to be recharged once, maybe twice a week. Um, given the way that it works, cause it works over Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah. It's not it. I mean, it's not it like, yeah, 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 yeah. Wi-Fi remotes it, with the Apple TV remote also is in that category are going to use a lot more power. It's, of course, a lot more functional. Right. But uh, but you don't have to worry about aiming at the TV and, and all of that crazy stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah I, no, the Harmony one is fantastic. We're very, very happy with with that. remote. Okay. We've had we've had that. God, I mean, we've probably had that 10 years now. I mean, it's, which is crazy to, to have a remote for us to have a remote that that long, but yeah, uh, yeah I so. think my, T, I think my Tiva remote uses RF. I think it's an option with, with the latest. I think it uses Bluetooth is specifically right, with the Tiva remote. Yes, correct. Correct. Yeah. That's the RF. Instead of RR. Yeah. I think, it, I think it's a, uh, yeah, I think I had to actually enable it, but. Um, right. Right. Yeah. RF is, you know better than ir i would say and they, yeah you don't have to aim it <laughs> yeah yeah cool yes 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 cool uh all right all right john take us to uh take us to johnny or i'll take us to johnny and you can you can you can deliver the answer johnny says uh let's say i recently had an issue where there may be no answer but i thought i would ask anyway i was reading email in the car while my wife was driving while reading an important email, I accidentally tapped the trash icon at the bottom. It's annoying that it's in the middle where I tend to hold my thumb. Uh, he says, but I tapped it when the car went over a bump. No problem, I thought. I can just go to the trash folder and move the message back to the inbox. Okay. Unfortunately, he says, when I opened the message, the car went over another bump and I hit the trash icon again. It seems that this permanently deletes the email from the phone. At least I was not able to find a way to restore it. I also discovered that I had forgotten that I could shake the phone to untrash the email rather than go to the trash and move the message. But hopefully I will remember that the next time and not delete an important email. So my thoughts on this were um, 
Well, twofold. Number one, if it's an IMAP email, you might be able to log into your email provider's website and find it there. Maybe, but no guarantees. It's possible that but hitting the delete from the trash folder truly expunged it. Um, the other thing is you can change the functionality of that button in mail. If you go into your iOS settings, go to it's in, it's weird now where they buried all this stuff. So go into the settings app on your iPhone, go to passwords and accounts, which is like a page and a half down and you'll see your email account there. You, you have to do this you, and you can control it individually for each email account, which I suppose is handy, but go to tap on the accounts there, tap on the account name, which you have to do twice. Then you get to the screen with your, like your password and server names or whatever hit advanced. And on the advanced screen, you have an option, move discarded messages into, and you can choose between the deleted mailbox and the archive mailbox. I set mine to archive because I, I archive far more frequently than I delete. If I want to delete, of course, I can swipe the message to the left and, and get that there. Or uh, I hold on the archive button and it shows me two options, archive or trash. So I can get to trash, but I wouldn't do it accidentally. So those were my thoughts on this, John, but I am now going to sit back and get some popcorn and learn from the master. Well, I had one thought. Yeah. Well, I had two thoughts, but I, the, the second thought didn't pan out here. Okay. But, uh, my first thought, um, if you have a time machine back up, oh. you may not know this, but time machine will let you go back in time. And retrieve emails from the past. So if you have a recent time machine backup, you may be able to, uh, that includes that email, you may be able to retrieve it. Right. right? So if he also has a Mac um, yes. and, and that Mac happened to get that email. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. His Mac would have had to be like on at home or, or unless it was an email that came in, you know, much earlier or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that idea. That's right. Right. It's not just the email server that might have a copy. Your Macs, all of your Macs might have a copy of this. <laughs> yeah. And that's a that's a really nice feature that I, I think a lot of people don't know about Time Machine is that if you activate it um, while you're running mail, it's going to give you a Time Machine view into your mail world. Right. Which, uh, right. Be, uh, which, hey. Uh, speaking of email workflows, that's that's something you may want to yeah keep in mind. Yeah, is that man. It's not gone forever as long as you maintain your uh, time machine backups. Now, the other thing I was thinking is, huh? I wonder. I was thinking that it may also be stored in a in a iOS backup, but I don't see mail as a category in iMazing. I, I was going to say. Maybe you can use iMazing to go to an old backup. Sure. And it's stored in there, but I don't see mail as an option here. Huh. Right, right, right. I, well, I see a files category. So, so I'm wondering if the thing I, I don't, do you know? I mean, I, I don't know if uh, a, an iOS backup contains your email. It, it looks like it may not. Oh, that's a good Maybe. question. It no, might. It, well, it has to be because I, think I, it I does. can see emails. Yeah. I think it has some and it'll download more if it needs it. But I think some of it is stored locally, but I, I just don't. I mean, I see the files cat. Maybe you have. Yeah. 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 I'll have to yeah, scratch yeah. my head. I'll have to think about that a bit more. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if an iOS backup may, may also contain uh, that, that lost email. Yeah. 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 You might be right about that. Huh? Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, 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 that's, it's far more difficult to get granular with restoring things. I, I would think if anything could do it, of course, I amazing would, because that's, that's, you know, the granular backup and restore utility for iOS. Uh, but I've never tried to do it with mail. So yeah, good thinking, man. I like that. That's good. That's good. It's good. As usual, we have lots of other things to go through. I, I, I want to, I think we have time for this one. Um, cr listener Craig had uh, ha had an interesting question, but it it's one of these things that it's about Thunderbolt. And I, I think perhaps we can we can use this to just make sure we're all always thinking about Thunderbolt for what it actually is. 
And and Craig, right. So so thank you, Craig, for 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 setting this up for us in, uh, in a great way. He says, I have an original 27 inch retina iMac equipped with Thunderbolt two ports. I want to connect a single SSD drive for backup and file storage. Encountering a huge challenge, though, in figuring out how best to make the connection and get maximum throughput from the SSD. If I use something simple like a USB A to USB C cable on a USB C based, you know, SSD enclosure, then I'm limited by um, the speeds of USB, which on this Mac are USB three. He says, uh, but some Macs might have USB two only, right? Like the one that I'm sitting in front of here has USB two uh, speeds. He says more expensive solutions like an OWC dock involve, you know, large uh, docks and are like 150 bucks and up. What's the answer? So I, as I as I said in setting this up, this is one of those things where where Thunderbolt can save the day because it offers near limitless expandability of your Mac. Thunderbolt isn't just a transfer bus like USB is. It is an expansion bus like PCI slots in a desktop computer, an old desktop computer, not IMAX, a desktop computer doesn't have slots, but it is like slots, right? That's the way we need to think about Thunderbolt. And, you know, for a Mac that, say, doesn't have USB 2 like this one here, but I want to connect a USB, or so it doesn't have USB 3, it has USB 2, but I want to connect a USB 3 drive. The good news is I can because I can use Thunderbolt to add, expand a USB 3 interface to it. And that interface could be a dock, like you mentioned, or something like that uh, connects USB 3 and Ethernet box that I have. But even that's like 100 bucks. You know, the, those things, The you are adding a USB chip. It's not just an adapter to go from the shape of a Thunderbolt connector to the shape of a USB connector. You need something in there that speaks USB 3 because your Mac doesn't. But via Thunderbolt, you can plug directly into the motherboard. That's a good way to think about Thunderbolt. And then you're plugging a USB three interface in that scenario. And actually, I think for Craig here, um, you, you know, you, you need to think about where the uh, for specifically for adding an SSD, you need to think about, you know, where the speed limits are going to be. So look at the SSDs that you're buying, look at what their maximum speeds are and then go that way. There are very, very few single drive enclosures with Thunderbolt on them. There's a lot of multi-drive enclosures with Thunderbolt because uh, you can you can take advantage of the the speeds of Thunderbolt there. But any drive enclosure, single or, single or multi, isn't just going to be a Thunderbolt drive, even if it has a Thunderbolt port on it. It's going to be a SATA drive or, you know, something of the sort, maybe a NVMI, NVMI, is that the right words? Whatever the other kind of interface is, but it's going to be a Thunderbolt 2 SATA or Thunderbolt 2 NVMe adapter uh, or interface in there that then plugs into the drive. So just think about that. And it's probably more cost effective to get something like a dock that can go, say, USB 3 uh, or you already have USB 3 on your Mac. So maybe you don't even need a dock because I don't know that your SSD is going to go faster than your USB 3 speeds, if that makes sense. Thoughts on that, John? Hmm. I'm just looking here and it looks like, yeah, I think... <clears throat> Yeah, I've never really explored Thunderbolt, but it looks like OWC does have some enclosures, including one that I think is just a single drive. Yeah. You can so do it. Pay. It's just going to be expensive. But with like a multi-drive enclosure, um, the nice part is, you know, you might have four SATA interfaces in there. All four of them are are connected to your Mac over the Thunderbolt bus. And the cool part is your Mac actually sees all four of those interfaces and sees the drive separately. So you can use software raid to, to collate them all together. Right. And, and that's a cool thing. So um, yeah, yeah, no Thunderbolt's just an expansion bus. That's, that's mm -hmm. the best way to think of it, uh, especially in, in these terms. But um, is there anything special about these OWC enclosures that have Thunderbolt for single drives? Uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll have to explore some more here. Yeah. 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 Oh so I'm just, I'm just curious, like what the benefit of that would be. Um, I'm, I'm looking to see. Do, well, depending there, on the version of Thunderbolt, I mean, the, the, the speed of uh -oh. some older technology. Oh, there you're back. Okay, good. Yeah. Huh, I'm looking on, uh, we'll have to look later. Cause I'm looking on, on, OWC and I'm only seeing Thunderbolt on like their Thunder Bay, right? You know, with the the six drives or whatever, you know, four drives even. But um I'm not seeing anything there with with a single drive with Thunderbolt, but I'm obviously not looking in the same place. So cool. All right. Well, yeah, it's again, it's just I I kind of wanted to go through that just to so that we are always thinking about Thunderbolt as the thing that it really is. It 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 really is the thing that as best it can future proofs our existing Macs, right? Cause even if, you know, like this Mac in front of me here, when it came out, USB three was not a common thing. I'm sure it existed, but it wasn't something Apple was doing future proof. Boom. I can do it. And when the ethernet port in this died before I had the motherboard replaced, I was able to use gigabit ethernet via Thunderbolt, right? Or I could have two gigabit ethernet connections if I wanted. And, you know, so I guess I, mean, I don't know that I need that, but there you go. You might, you never know. You might have two different networks you got to connect to. So there you go. That's, uh, but that's what we got for today. My friend, my friends, right? Mr. Braun with the show that never ends. Welcome back. That's right. Yeah, we will. Uh, <laughs> it's so far. That's true. So far. That's true. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, uh, we made it through the entire show without any April Fool's jokes, and I'm I'm happy about that. I don't I don't like uh, misleading our listeners, so that's good. And hopefully, we did not mislead our listeners. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. I want to thank uh, all of you for listening. Of course, thank um, everyone who's a premium subscriber. I have a bunch of you to thank. Uh, individually that we, we will do uh, next episode. Just had a lot of things going here today and uh, I'd like to make sure we have the time for you. But if you are a premium listener, don't forget you have access to that premium at MacGeekGab.com email address. Everybody has access to the phone number, which is 224-888-GEEK. And of course, John Geek is... 433 Five. That's right. Uh, iTunes reviews. We really, really want them. MacGeekGab.com slash iTunes will get you as close as we can get you. I would love to have you either uh, post a new review or if you've posted one in the past, you can update your review. And I think that actually helps us, too. So please go do that. Even if it was already five stars, you can just change some of the text or add something to it. And it'll... Uh, It'll, you know, it'll boost it up for, for us and for you. And as John pointed out last week, that's a good thing. I want to thank Cashfly at uh, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. And uh, I want to thank, our, of course, all of our sponsors. Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Keeps at keeps.com slash MGG. Eero at Eero.com slash MGG with coupon code MGG. And of course, LinkedIn jobs at LinkedIn.com slash MGG. Otherworld Computing in the podcast marketplace. Barebone Software. All good stuff. John, you got us into this mess today. Do you have uh, any advice to get us out? I think it's good advice. It's always good advice to get yourself out of any mess. Thing you want to do first is make sure you don't get caught. Made up. Man.